identifying substance abuse, how to talk about it, and how you can help. And this is timely, especially before our, our program ends this week, um, in talks with many of you and also during trainings. Um, this is an area where I've heard a lot of um, need and specifically in terms of CHWs um, wanting to know more about uh, how to talk with mom when um, you suspected that there's been used but also how you can motivate her to possibly change her, uh, change her uh, use and get her to treatment. And this is a webinar that is also associated with uh, a promising practice um, uh, report that is uh, posted on our website under COE publications. And in this report, they are, um, there are categories of, of use that you can read on, the rates of drug use, the effects of these drugs during pregnancy, and then also what you can do as a CHW. And it, what's really nice is, uh, of the report is that um, it is important that uh, if you want to speak to your um, mom or client about this, that is important to understand the drug use, um, the, the different categories and how each one have different effects, but also how it affects the body and also specifically during pregnancy as well. Um, so I, if you want to get comfortable in, in talking to your clients about, uh, about, the, about drug use, I would strongly uh, recommend that you read the report and understand the different categories of, of different substances um, so that you can comfortable, get comfortable with it, speaking about the subject, um, because then if you want to gain that trust from your client to talk honestly about their use and about their struggles and uh, whether how ready they are to seek treatment. Um, you want to be able to be uh, feel comfort about talking about the subject as well. <clears throat> so we today we have Dr. Aaron Fields who really in his practice. Uh, this is his focus. This is his um, expertise. So I'm happy to have him here to share um, some information uh, about, um, uh, about this area. And um, he can also talk about how you can approach the report as well and provide you some resources. So I thank you for uh, you all joining us and feel free throughout the presentation to post your, write in your um, questions. Uh, in the chat box and uh, we will monitor uh, as we go through and some questions we'll be able to address at the time and some questions we may wait um, to a little later in the presentation to address but feel free as you have questions post them on the chat box and we will monitor and address them so thank you for uh, being here and also your participation and I am going to let Dr. Fields take it on. Hi thank you very much Raquel. Um, so the first thing we wanted to start with was some of the poll results that you guys all clicked through um, when you logged in. I wanted to have you guys polled as you're entering the, the chat to give us some context for what we're talking about. Um, I'm ecstatic and thrilled that uh, almost half of you have had prior training in SBIRT, um, which will make this whole process a lot easier because the best resource that you have um, as CHWs for convincing anybody to do anything is Esper. It's, it's kind of, I jokingly refer to it with some of our residents as like Jedi mind tricks to get people to do what they should be doing um, for their health. Um, but then the second question also drives home the importance of this topic um, that three quarters of you have suspected um, that your clients were using drugs in the last 12 months. And so that, that drives home the point that there is a lot of drug use among pregnant women um, those we'll get to a little bit later. It's not actually as prevalent in New York as it is in a lot of other states. Um, and so I guess that's something to be thankful for. So let's see. So the, as mentioned, the general purpose of this is to um, provide you guys some basic information about what, all, what are the different drugs of abuse? What are the different categories of drugs? Um, as, as best we can kind of clump them together. A little bit of statistics about drug and alcohol use, um, and then some specific pregnancy-related complications. Finally, we'll finish with an introduction to SBIRT 
and what are some of the basics about addiction treatment. I'm not gonna give all of the details of all of this because um, that's part of the reason we ended up with a 44 page report is that there's a ton of information. Um, but I'll try to touch on a lot of this information as we go through here. Um, the report is available on the website right now. Um, this kind of basic approach to the report um, was kind of born out of my thought process as I was writing it. Um, and a lot of times it's easy to try to write the report start to finish as this is the order in which you should read it. Unfortunately, as I was writing it, I, it felt right in the order it was done. But as I went back to look at it, how I would use it clinically, don't read it start to finish front to back. Um, it's a great resource, but reading it front to back is probably going to be a little bit more uh, uh, difficult than, than it's worth. Um, the most important section of it is at the end is that basics about expert. So particularly for people who haven't had training in expert before, read that section right near the beginning so that you understand uh, some of those core concepts because it's good to have that framework in place before you then go learn about what the different drugs are. Um, because understanding why you're learning the details about the drugs will give better context to it and make it easier to remember. Um, also towards the beginning, I would read the intro and the what is addiction. One of the biggest barriers we have to talking with people about their drug use problems or about convincing people to get into addiction treatment is the stigma surrounding addiction. Just the other day, I was doing a onboarding training at one of our local rural hospitals and speaking to one of the pharmacists uh, there, she mentioned that she used to work in an outpatient pharmacy and it, it actually made me quite angry at the time because she mentioned that she had saw a lot of people coming in with their Suboxone prescriptions and that she would start accusing them of, oh, you're not really clean, you know, you've traded an illegal opiate for a legal one. And although I was trying to be on my best behavior, I kind of got into it with her because that displays the profound misunderstanding about addiction treatment and about what some of these medications do, that somebody in a role such as a pharmacist should know better. And so if somebody who should know better doesn't, there are, there are dozens or hundreds of thousands of people who, who don't expect to know better, who don't understand what addiction is, what is addiction treatment, and what are these basics. And so understanding how that addicted brain operates and how it messes with your head and reprograms a lot of your basic functions um, gives good insight into why people who are addicted to drugs behave the way they do. Um, the next part to get into would be the uh, screening tools, which are located in, in Appendix B. Everybody has a different favorite screening tool that they use. Um, the three that we included um, are primarily focused on alcohol use, drug use, and then one for adolescents specifically, um, because many of the uh, drug using uh, pregnant women that you guys work with, I understand, are, are adolescent age in between 16 to 24. Um, once you have picked out your screening tool of use, um, the drugs of abuse section will provide information about what the different drugs are that helps you recognize them, but also helps you have a conversation with people about it. So when you find out that your client is using a sedative, you know what symptoms they're probably expecting and you can just ask them blankly about those symptoms. You don't have to ask them very generically, what are you experiencing? You can ask them, how sedated do you get? Is it helping you sleep? Is it helping with your anxiety? Are you getting constipated? Is it doing anything else? Um, the rates of drug use is probably not as clinically useful, but it's very interesting and it gives you some context for how likely is this person to be using X, Y, or Z drug. Um, particularly in upstate New York, for example, methamphetamine use is barely existent. I'm not gonna say non-existent, but there is very little methamphetamine use in our community compared to um, the American Southwest, for instance. And so these rates of drug use um, help you determine what do you expect to see in the community. And lastly, I would reread the expert section, just to give you that primer before you actually go talk to the patient and try to use it. There's an alternative approach, which is a little bit better for actually using it in the moment for for somebody who does not have any prior training in expert, just read the intro and the expert part, pick your screening tool, but then once you've identified that drug, read through the different sections about it, and then go back to the patient or the client and talk to them about it and skip all the other parts of this uh, 
sections about the other drugs that are not relevant for that particular person. Um, I suspect this is probably how most of you will, will likely end up using the report, unless you have a good deal of free time and you want to read through the entire report ahead of time. So what are the different drugs of abuse? Most common ones that we'll see in our area are the opioids. Um, as you guys are probably well aware, uh, we're in the midst of an opioid epidemic. Uh, it traces its roots back to 1996 when OxyContin, the long-lasting oxycodone formulation, hit the market. Uh, that coupled with uh, some well-placed funding money from Purdue Pharma and the push by the American Pain Association to list pain as the fifth vital sign, um, all that kind of culminated over the last decade and a half, two decades, um, in this flooding uh, of the American landscape with opioids. Most of the people who are currently abusing heroin at some point or another either started with a prescription opioid that was theirs or somebody else's. Um, most people don't just kind of jump to heroin right off the bat. Don't get me wrong, some do, um, but they, they tend to be the exception, not the rule. Um, stimulants is a category of drugs that includes cocaine in both its powdered and crack formulation. Um, a lot of the medications that are currently used as ADHD medications, it's like Adderall, Ritalin, uh, Vyvanse, these are all stimulants. They turn your brain on. Um, nicotine is a separate but mild stimulant. Um, nicotine, we gave its own section because it is by far the most abused drug in America. Um, and is particularly bad in pregnancy. Um, in many cases, actually worse than stimulants, than the, the other stimulants like crack. Alcohol is alcohol, it's well known, um, generates fetal alcohol syndrome, lots of complications for mother and baby, um, and just like nicotine, also legal. Marijuana, um, I don't think needs further explanation. The sedative hypnotic class um, is, probably the most vague class of medications or drugs on here. Um, it includes things that are used to treat anxiety, insomnia. Um, some of the more common known ones are like Xanax, Valium, all the benzodiazepines or barbiturates, phenobarbital. Um, but then also um, we, in medicine, we refer to them as the Z drugs. So like Zolpidem or Ambien. So, uh, well, I'm blanking on the other names, but if you tell your doctor you have insomnia and they prescribe you something, it's from this class almost, almost 100% of the time. The hallucinogens um, and inhalants we left out at the bottom because these are very rarely used um, in the general population. Um, and particularly hallucinogens, there's not really any known negative effects on pregnancy other than the fact that they increase your risk-taking behaviors and you're more likely to end up in some sort of physical trauma uh, secondary to that. Um, the hallucinogens are things like um, ecstasy, mushrooms, LSD, MDMA, molly. And then last but not least is inhalants. Inhalants are particularly important to understand for adolescents. Um, generally speaking, as people age out of that adolescent age group, they tend to stop using inhalants, often because they have either realized, I don't want to do drugs anymore, or because they've moved on to, um, to other, uh, other substances that produce a high that lasts longer than the seconds to minutes that inhalants give. Um, but really important to know about inhalants is that they can produce a inhalant or fetal inhalant syndrome that is quite similar to fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, and so that's always my drive home point. A lot of adolescents will use inhalants because they have this idea that they're safer um, even when pregnant and it's just not true. They are terrible, terrible, terrible things for your brain and for the baby. Oh, uh, I think on this slide I was trying to group them together and, and to a certain extent they can kind of be grouped together into four different broader categories. Um, alcohol inhalants, because of their effect on the fetus, these are probably the worst ones for fetal development um, and the ones that deserve kind of the most attention if you notice that your pregnant clients are using them. Um, nicotine and stimulants are uh, not good for baby, don't generally cause direct immediate harm, but continued use during pregnancy uh, will typically lead to restricted fetal growth. 
um, and can lead to some mild withdrawal symptoms after birth. Opioids and sedatives um, similarly don't cause uh, a lot of direct problems to the pregnancy, but can cause withdrawal after birth. Um, some of the sedatives have been associated with cleft palate, um, but it's not a directly known link and it's actually pretty easily repaired. So many people don't consider that to be a, a major adverse effect. Um, and then lastly is marijuana and the hallucinogens, um, which I get into in the report in a little more detail, um, but are somewhat surprisingly safe during pregnancy. And I say it with that inflection in my voice because I don't think people should know that because I wouldn't encourage people to use any substances during pregnancy. But if, if you're going to, those would be the ones to do because there's no evidence of significant harm. Um, then we'll get into the meat of this and the main reason that you guys are here listening to me yammer on. So ESPERT is a kind of a philosophy of treatment um, when it comes down to it. That the idea is once you've identified a problem in your, in your patient or your client, that there are things you can do outside of providing medications or formalized treatment that just essentially being a human being to another human being, talking to them, educating them, informing them, and helping them uh, make the decisions that, that they want for their own good. And so the first part is screening. The meat and potatoes of it is the brief intervention. And then the uh, tail end of it is the referral to treatment. Screening and brief intervention have a great uh, research background to them. There's a lot of evidence supporting their efficacy, um, not just uh, clinical efficacy, but cost efficacy. It's one of the best things uh, to invest money in with regards to a healthcare system um, and saves tons of money down the road. The referral to treatment arm has very little research surrounding it, um, and this is due to a methodologic problems in the designs of the studies on ESPERT. Typically, they don't include uh, patients who have very severe addiction problems in ESPERT studies, and they do that in an attempt to try to actually focus on the brief intervention arm, but in excluding those people who are almost uniformly referred to treatment, they aren't able to actually follow up on the efficacy of that referral. And so it's, it's kind of an inherent problem, um, but there is a newfound focus on that. And there is some research coming down the pipeline of actually seeing whether referrals to treatment help or not. Um, all of the, the, the general consensus of uh, people in addiction treatment is that referral is an important and needed part of ESPERT, um, but it doesn't have that same research grounding. So in the brief intervention, the two parts that I want to give a little bit more infor information about are motivational interviewing and the readiness ruler. Motivational interviewing is a means of talking to people um, that keeps the patient as the primary focus or, or for you guys, the client. Um, I will use those terms kind of interchangeably. I'm and just reflexively referring to people as patients due to my job. Um, the importance of keeping them as the primary focus comes down to uh, a philosophical decision um, in ESPERT as a, compared to a lot of other uh, aspects of medicine. And, and in much of medicine, much of psychiatry, uh, there is kind of this ephemeral focus. And the patient or the person is there, but there's more than just that. There is uh, keeping in mind social goods and system costs, and there's more than just the person. In motivational interviewing, you are ignoring everything else that is going on, you're ignoring their behaviors, you're ignoring their drug use, and uh, the person and what they value and what they want are the primary focus. And by keeping that as the focal point, it will alter your behavior in talking to people. And people notice that. They notice when you're ignoring all these other bad things they're doing and you're focusing on them. Um, and particularly when they know they're doing lots of other stuff that they shouldn't be doing, it's a really good way to connect to people. If they know that you still care about them as an individual, regardless of all the other stuff they're doing, um, it's a great way to get buy-in. Um, during the motivational interviewing process, you want to repeatedly encourage people 
to identify how their own behaviors are impacting the things they value. Um, the goal behind it is not to tell somebody what they're doing wrong, but to help them realize for themselves what they're doing. Um, none of us like being lectured to. I still distinctly recall being lectured to as a kid, and it almost never works, right? You can lecture to a kid all you want, but the kid's probably not gonna change what they're doing until they experience those negative outcomes and realize and make that decision for themselves. Um, so our goal is to try to help people identify initially small things that they can adjust, that they can do differently to decrease their negative outcomes. Um, and then once they realize that there can be some, uh, some momentum in, in, in developing change in their life, they will often be much more interested in developing what we call an action plan to make some bigger changes. Part of that action plan has to be uh, arranging follow-up and a means by which they can be held accountable. You know, we all um, have jobs, we all have expectations levied on us, but if we didn't have a boss who was gonna come tell us afterwards, hey, you didn't do your job, or you weren't gonna get your paycheck if you didn't do your job, or there wasn't gonna be social judgment, would you necessarily do it? And that's a big question, it's a philosophical question. Um, things that people do volunteering, yeah, you're gonna do that regardless of whether there's outcomes or not. But if there are big changes that you don't necessarily want to do in the first place, um, if nobody's ever gonna hold you accountable for it or actually check with you, then there's very little uh, persistent motivation to do it. And so something as simple as, hey, I'm gonna come back by a few weeks from now um, just to chat and see how you're doing, um, provides them some accountability. The readiness ruler is a very simple concept that we use throughout medicine that is basically um, trying to identify where somebody is with their readiness to change and helping them inch up slowly. Um, it's kind of similar to uh, the old stages of change model um, where somebody is not going to be ready to make a change until they hit this uh, X, Y, and Z uh, markers along that way. And so the four questions that you want to ask somebody when applying the readiness ruler is what change are you considering? How important is it that you make this change? How confident are you that you're actually going to be able to make the change? And how ready are you to make this change? That last one is the most important one. A lot of times people know what changes needs, what, what they need to change, even if they recognize that it's really important and that they think they can do it, they may not be ready to. Um, particularly when people are using drugs, especially pregnant women who are using drugs, they know that, that what they're doing isn't good for their baby. The, it, it is the rare pregnant woman who doesn't know that her drug use is bad for her baby. Um, you know, most people in general, most people aren't idiots. Um, and we were actually, Raquel and I were talking earlier, many, many people who are using drugs, there's this stigma of drug users being burnouts and fools, and it's just not true. Um, they are they are you, they are me, they are everyday people, um, many of whom are fully aware that what they're doing is not good for them. Um, but being ready to make the change is so much more important than knowing that they need to make a change. And then what you do with this, once the person tells you how ready they are to make a change, pretty much regardless of what number they tell you, uh, my follow-up question is always, oh, that's interesting, why not lower? And I'll usually say a number instead of why not lower, but if they say, you know, doc, I am at a six out of 10, I wanna change, I'm not quite sure if I'm ready, but I know there's something I need to do, I wanna do, and I'm ready to do it, but I'm hesitant. My response is, well, what puts you at a six instead of a four? What puts you at a six instead of a three? And the whole point behind that is just to get them to reiterate in their head all the reasons that they want to make a change, all the reasons they think they can. Um, and then once they've gone through that whole list again, reiterating to themselves and kind of pumping themselves up, you then do it one more time and you ask them, what would it take for you to be one or two points higher than where you are? which essentially drives them back through that same list that they just had and then adding to it. This is a sneaky way of getting people to make an action plan um, without being as blunt about it. There is a time for bluntness, but the readiness ruler is not it. Um, 
I, I love this. I use it in the ED all the time um, to, to talk to people about smoking and their drug use because so many of the people who come through the ED are there because of a consequence of alcohol or drug use. And so even if that's not really why they're there, it's really why they're there. Um, and I've, I've had a lot of people buy into me sending them home with prescriptions for Chantix or Nicorette patches or Nicorette gum, even though they originally showed up with like a broken arm or a cut. Um, and so it's, it's interesting the amount of progress you can help people make just by getting them to think more about something that they usually just kind of breeze over. So I want to get into some sample patients because, um, you know, learning and training is great and all, but until you actually apply it to patients it's, or clients, it's uh, not as relevant. So the first patient's a 24-year-old female who is 16 weeks gestational age. This is your first visit with her. You've never met her before. Um, she's otherwise healthy, not working, doesn't actually use drugs or, or alcohol, seems pretty responsible. Um, but you note that she and her house smell very heavily of cigarette smoke. Um, everything's kind of yellow stained and you cough as you walk in the room because you are naturally not a cigarette smoker. <laughs> What's your biggest concern for this patient? And what can you do? Or what do you do? And what can you do? I'd actually like to hear from, from some of the CHWs what their normal response is when they walk into a client list. I'm sure all of you had walked in like this, uh, have walked into patients like this. Oh, I was gonna say, who wrote on the screen? It wasn't me. <laughs> so if you can either type in your response in chat, but sometimes it's easier to um, mute yourself or raise your hand and we'll mute you um, to talk uh, through your phone line, through the audio. So you may need a few seconds to think about what your, uh, response would be if you, if you walked in to, into this patient. Um, what would you say? How would you respond? Do you want to put back the patient to kind of yeah. see the, the type of the yeah. sample? <clears throat> Oh, come on, I'm sure some of you have experienced a patient like this before. I didn't have to stretch my oh, brain too much. There, there you go. Goes. I would ask if they knew someone else who smokes and make them aware of the dangers of second and third hand smoke on mom and baby. Perfect. That is the essence of expert boiled down. Um, at the end of the day, informing them of, of the risks and dangers of what they're doing is exactly what you should be doing. Um, smoking in particular is one of the uh, things that most Americans know the, the risks of. Um, and so the, the next step for this mom, I think would be um, making sure that she knows the resources to help her with smoking cessation. Because most people who are smoking who don't want to smoke, um, it's usually because they know the risks, they know the dangers, but nicotine is a, is a heck of a drug and it's it is very 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 difficult to smoke quit smoking on your own um we all know those people who have been able to white knuckle it through nicotine uh cessation but they are again the exception to the rule um most pcps primary care doctors and OBGYNs are very familiar with smoking cessation medications they may not be quite as familiar with chantix um but the gum lozenges and patches are are pretty uh readily prescribable. Uh, we have another question of, uh, question if there is someone else in the house. So if it's not the mom, if someone else, if it's a partner or a family member that's the smoker. Yeah, that's a great question because secondhand smoke uh, does most of the same things that mm -hmm. primary smoking uh, does to the baby. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not sure, do you guys interact much with the spouses that are in the household or the other people in the house they, they may they may okay um but 
So what messages then could be given to the woman? So the kind of driving home the point that secondhand smoke is just as bad as her smoking. Um, oftentimes when a woman gets pregnant, all of the focus is on her and her mm -hmm. behaviors and what she's doing and right. how her life kind of gets co-opted mm -hmm. by this new life growing inside of her. Um, and the other people, <coughs> men <coughs> in the household, mm -hmm. forget that their behaviors and their um, actions still have an effect on the baby, mm -hmm. um, particularly when it comes to drug use. Um, and so making sure to include uh, those other people in your conversations um, Espert works just as well on on non-pregnant guys as it does on pregnant women. Actually, I take that back. It probably works better on pregnant women than it does on anybody else because pregnant women are usually a little bit more motivated and willing to make a change, yeah. but it still works on the guys in the house. Um, and all of these smoking cessation, other than Chantix, all of those other things are available over the counter. You can get nicotine gum lozenges and patches without a physician's uh, prescription. And so trying to encourage um, smoking partners to just go to the pharmacy and pick it up um, can be the first step to making a change. Usually the easiest thing um, and the one that people are most willing to try out, and this is what I do with a lot of my opioid dependent patients who, who just can't stop smoking, is once you get them to agree to just try using gum and lozenges once a day, you know, when they get, one, just pick one craving once a day where like, ah, you know, I really want to go smoke a cigarette. Instead of smoking that one cigarette, toss a lozenge or a piece of gum in and get that, get your nicotine fixed that way. When it's done, if you still want to go smoke, great, go smoke. Um, but just trying to slowly cut back and people will slowly start to realize they can get the, the same fix from that adjunct than they, that they do from the cigarette. Um, Great, that's a fantastic comment. Um, that so, uh, Stanley C commented that even though she denies alcohol and drug use, I would still tell her the dangers in the use of these items. That's that's exactly right. Um, it, looking at the overall population of people in America who use drugs, um, the rates of smoking nicotine is dramatically higher in drug users than in everybody else, and so. The flip side to that correlation is that people who smoke are a little bit more likely to be using any other drugs as well. And so if you've got somebody who is smoking cigarettes, just giving them the information, um, even if they truly aren't using any drugs or alcohol, giving them that information so that that will help build up their wall of resistance should somebody come by the house and say, hey, I just got this stuff. It's really good. Want to try? Um, just making sure that they know their, their reasons not to mm -hmm. is a very good point. Do others have any uh, other ways that you've addressed this that you want to share? Any strategies you've used? <laughs> Specifically in addressing when there's, there's the, the other people in the house that are, that are using, you know, they're smoking and um, that maybe you provide certain messages to the woman about how that affects her and her and her, the health. Uh, say more about workshops. If you can just expand on what you mean. <laughs> I'm not sure what the, all the dot dot dots go. mean. <laughs> all right, uh, Sue. We will hold workshops at the center regarding the risk of drug use with the clients. Okay. Yeah, that's great. And that way that's you're good. hitting uh, proverbial two birds with one stone. Mm -hmm. um, so not only are you able to inform multiple people all at once, but whoa. Um, I think somebody may have an elbow on a keyboard. Yeah, Shauna. Or... Um, 
<laughs> um, but in, in holding workshops for multiple people all at once, you provide those people with a social support system. Um, just the same way that we encourage people who are in addiction treatment to go to uh, group therapy sessions or to outside uh, AA or NA meetings, um, that social connection um, can also provide a, a fantastic outlet and source of support for people. And it's also not threatening too. Here's a workshop if you're interested, come and learn about the risks. And if, even if they have not um, admitted, right, to some uh, use that if they just come in to just hear about it, um, I mean, that's the first step. And you know, that's a great point. I, I come from a little bit of a different perspective than a mm -hmm. lot of you guys do. And so it's easy for me to say that I'm really blunt with my clients yes. <laughs> or with my patients and yeah. say, hey, I know you're using drugs. Right. Um, but that's usually because I'm not seeing them unless it's already been proven that they're using drugs. Sure. You guys are seeing people in their homes. Yep. Um, and so that non-threatening approach of mm -hmm. here's some more information. You want to come learn and maybe meet some other expecting mm -hmm. moms. Yep, exactly. So, oh, this one. Tomorrow has stated, uh, what I find works best is to give the mom a spiral notebook or journal, um, and I tell her to write the baby um, every time she has the urge to smoke. It may not keep her from ultimately having a cigarette, but it will delay her and uh, maybe stop her that time. And that the moms really do write in the journal. I totally believe it. You know, Like I was saying earlier, pregnant moms have more motivation than anybody else to quit, and they usually understand that what they're doing is is not great for the baby. And so just giving her that, that physical reminder that, you know, there is an effect to what I'm doing. That is probably for a lot of people, just enough of an incentive to get them to, to quit smoking. That's a fantastic technique. Thank you for sharing. The health uh, benefits of quitting and how the body works to heal itself. So you know, you're gloom and doom and think it's hopeless to even try. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Accentuating the positive. Six to 12 months after quitting smoking, the body already makes dramatic improvements in, in a lot of those negative effects from smoking. Um, and that's one of the nice things about smoking cessation is that you can actually recover from the negative effects of it. Uh, there are a lot of medical conditions where once you have skipped your care for long enough, you can't really make or you can't regain that loss, but not the case with smoking. Providing brochures to the client is a great way to approach them. Again, a great non-threatening approach mm -hmm. um, that doesn't say I'm accusing you of anything, but here's some information. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about that? Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the basics that I had kind of laid out for that patient are exactly what you guys have been talking about, discussing the risks of tobacco use during pregnancy, health benefits of quitting, cost savings of quitting is one that we often mm -hmm. forget. Um, a lot of pregnant women, one of their big stressors is this baby is going to be expensive and I've got to buy a whole bunch of stuff for it. Um, and not buying cigarettes is a great way to do that. Um, you can even, similar to the journal, if you give them a, a little old school bell jar and just tell them each time that you're going to buy a pack of cigarettes and you're able to stop yourself from buying that pack of cigarettes or each time you stop yourself from smoking a cigarette, put a dollar in that jar because that's a dollar you just saved. It's hard to get individuals to stop smoking, but I would share tips that may cut down third-hand smoke, such as smoking outside, wearing a raincoat over their clothing, um, other individual who smokes outside of the mother. Yeah, we're trying to meet people where they are in the stages of change. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. Um, I'm glad you brought up the smoking outside. Um, that, that popped in my head earlier, and I forgot to forgot to bring it up um, for the extra for the uh, other people in the household. Um, just telling them, look, hey, during the pregnancy, you can't smoke inside anymore. Um, that's a, an ad adaptation that most people are willing to make, um, especially in the setting of a pregnancy. Um, I have not heard the raincoat over their clothing before, um, but that is, that is a fantastic recommendation um, just to keep that, the smoke from getting into their clothing. Um, especially once a, uh, an infant is already in the house, um, one of the biggest risks for SIDS is sudden infant death syndrome is. Uh, having, for whatever reason, don't really know why, but having things in the house that still smell like smoke. Um, yeah, so we've discussed the stages of changes, uh, the readiness ruler, and setting that action plan. Whether you set out a firm, solid, written down action plan or not is uh, something that can be left open to how the moment feels. 
if it seems like the person is just about ready to throw you out of their house after all your yammering, uh, then maybe wait till next time to actually set a firm action plan. Um, reflective listening um, is uh, it's part of motivational interviewing. And what the idea behind it is that you're going to, in a very non-threatening, polite way, kind of repeat back to people what they're telling you. Um, and the main benefit of it is that oftentimes we talk and talk and talk and don't always listen to what we're saying. We're not always processing in the same way the words that are coming out of our own mouth as it, we would if we were to hear somebody else saying it. It's really easy to say something ridiculous or silly or stupid and not recognize it. But when you hear somebody else saying it, it's usually a lot easier to pick it up. And so if a patient tells you, you know, I don't think I can quit smoking because I just really like cigarettes. Um, sometimes just the process of repeating it back to them by saying, so what you're telling, so what I'm hearing you say is that you're not ready to quit smoking because even though you're pregnant, you, you also still really like cigarettes. And sometimes just hearing that statement, people will go, wow, that is a very self-centered statement for me to make. I'm pregnant. You know, maybe I need to readjust my priorities. And it gives people a chance to hear their own words. Um, we just got another comment from Tamara. I tell them to use a receiving blanket with a print on one side and nothing on the other. Uh, this makes a barrier between the smell of smoke on the clothes and the baby. The print helps the sleep deprived mom know which side touches the baby and which side lays against the smoker's clothing. Interesting. Um, so not being super, super familiar with new babies as I don't have one myself. Um, receiving blanket, is this a plastic lined or like? No, what? it's just like just any baby blanket oh, okay. in general. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh, so you know which side had born. the print. Yes. Got it. Now I get it. <laughs> I, was, I was trying to figure out what the barrier between <laughs> it's the blanket itself. Okay. Yeah. I'm giving away my age. Um, <laughs> So I really like reflective listening. Um, just the same way with motivational interviewing is that it just gives people a chance to be self-analytical on their own. And the more that you can get people to do their own self-analysis and their own growth, the less work you have to do. Um, are there any questions specifically about this first uh, client before we get into the, the next one? Any, any experiences you want to comment on for this? Because this particular patient or client was 24 years old. So um, any thoughts of your own experiences with someone this age? All right. In the meanwhile, we can move on. If anybody has any other uh, thoughts or experiences, they can uh, comment and we'll jump back to it. The second patient I want to talk about is a 21-year-old female. She's eight weeks pregnant. This is your first visit with her during this pregnancy, but you met her before during a prior pregnancy. Um, that last pregnancy ended in a miscarriage um, at about 16 weeks. Um, and so you already have somewhat of a prior relationship with her, um, but you haven't seen her in a couple of years. Um, she, you know that she has a history of skin infections um, and she's currently taking some antibiotics. Um, and when you come to see her in warm weather, very dissimilar from what we are currently experiencing in the middle of summer, um, let's say it's 95 degrees out and sweltering, humid and gross. You go in to see her and in her poorly air conditioned house, she's wearing pants and a sweater. Um, I know that I've been emphasizing the pants and sweater, but how would, how would most of you guys kind of address this or how would any of you address this patient as you're first walking in? Um, what are the big things that would jump to your mind as issues to bring up with her? Again, you can write in a chat box or if you want to unmute yourself and speak through the audio or raise your hand and we can uh, unmute you.
<laughs> All right. Um, so obviously the, oh, exactly. Um, so Sue has said that she would ask her if she's gone to a doctor for the physical stuff, uh, for a physical. Um, and that's a great place to start. Um, it would seem since she's on antibiotics, she probably has gone to a doctor. Um, unfortunately, a lot of primary care doctors, um, their schedules are getting so overwhelmed now um, that it doesn't surprise me when they don't pick up on drug use um, because they've got a whopping minute with each patient. Um, and so oftentimes, especially if it's a patient who's known to them, um, they will often kind of fly through and say, oh, you have a skin infection, here's some antibiotics, follow up with me in a month if it's not getting, uh, getting better. And that's a great point uh, to confirm that the doctor knows she's pregnant. There are some antibiotics that are not safe in pregnancy. Um, and so confirming that her doctor knew she's pregnant is really important. Um, in particular, uh, drugs like, um, the, the class is called aminoglycosides, but um, things like uh, the, the traditional z -pack, um, azithromycin, um, that stuff is not okay to be taking during pregnancy and it's pretty bad for baby. Um, and so one of the things I would want to make sure we talk about uh, with the client when you're, when you're seeing her is why she's wearing long clothing. Um, it may seem kind of like an odd topic to bring up when you're there to do a prenatal visit, um, but it's an important thing to bring up because it is uh, it, the same way that if she was wearing a tank top and shorts in the middle of winter, you want to make sure that she has appropriate clothing for her environment. Even if there's not a concern of drug use, um, it may be that she doesn't have the proper clothing for the weather and you don't want a pregnant woman uh, becoming dehydrated because she is overheating um, because she doesn't have proper clothing for the weather. But then one of the things I would ask is if it seems like they're intentionally covering up, um, find an excuse to try to see her arms or legs. Um, I include the legs in that because there are a lot of people who uh, use injection drugs who don't shoot up in the traditional places because they don't want to get caught. And so they'll focus on like the back of their calves or in between their toes. Um, and a great, the second bullet point is a great excuse that I use for any time I want to do anything strange with a patient is I tell them like, Oh, sorry, it's part of our routine assessment. Um, it's not my fault. It's the protocol. Um, even if it's not really part of your protocol, they don't know your protocols. Um, but in particular with this lady with her history of skin infections, I think that's an easy way to tell her like, Hey, I want to look at your skin. You've had a history of infections you're on by antibiotics. I just want to check to see if it's working. Um, and so in the process of looking at her arms and legs, you identify track marks on both forearms. And the next question then becomes, okay, great. You've identified track marks. What do you do? What do you do about those track marks? Um, and for those who are unfamiliar with what track marks are, uh, I realize not everybody may know what I'm referring to. Track marks are needle marks that typically follow along a vein, um, much like this. Um, so if they say no, they don't want you to look at their skin, then, then that's kind of where that part of the assessment ends. Um, you know, you can try making the argument with them that you don't have to be a doctor to want to check out an infection and see if it's getting better. Um, but again, I wouldn't try, um, forcing the issue because what's more important is that you maintain that connection and maintain their willingness to work with you to try to slowly get them to advance forward through the stages of change or along the readiness ruler. Um, yeah, that's a great point. They, they may just say no. Mm -hmm. uh, so as I was saying, track marks are just needle marks on the arms. They're pretty um, easy to identify, often have a lot of bruising associated with them. Um, sometimes you'll see them in all sorts of states of, of healing. Is there anyone on the line that, that has noticed something like this with the, your clients? Okay. Yeah. But this, this will be in something really important for you to get familiar with because then you will know what kind of 
treatment, what kind of referral they will need. All right, so they may not, um, in terms of uh, what they may be ready to, they may not be ready to go to a treatment center um, to stop the or discontinue drug use, um, but they may be ready uh, to for a needle exchange type of program to make sure that they're not sharing needles um, and that they're doing it in the most <laughs> safest way um, in terms of keeping uh, themselves healthy from getting other uh, diseases and passing it on to their child. So I'm glad that, that those pictures were, uh, you included those, just to get familiar with that. So there are a lot of ways to approach the issue with the, with the person. Um, once you've identified any sort of indication of drug use, be it needle marks, paraphernalia around the house, maybe they're actually high when you go see them one time. Um, don't try having a conversation with them while they're intoxicated because it's probably not going to go well. Um, but the next time you see them, there are the, the main two approaches that people have to it um, are asking permission to broach the subject. That's probably going to go over best um, for community health workers. Um, because as, as you guys have mentioned, um, you're trying to meet patients where they are. Um, you don't have the, the benefit that I often approach it with, which is I already know people are using drugs. If you guys are still in that realm of, you know, we're trying to see where they're at and how ready they are to change, just asking somebody, can I talk to you about the needle marks in your arms? If they say no and put up that wall, you don't want to try barging through it um, because it's going to lead to them withdrawing um, and and kind of refusing to interact. Um, but if they are willing to talk to you about it, um, that's a great opening to try to provide them some information and some education um, and information about, about resources. The other approach that I often take is kind of a non-accusatory directed acceptance um, of the obvious truth. Um, Raquel and I were talking a little bit before uh, starting the webinar that oftentimes just addressing the issue with somebody, just using some of their own lingo back to them. Um, what have you been injecting? How do you use your drugs? Um, how long have you been using? How long have you been injecting? Um, getting familiar with some of the terminology and some of the drugs and some of the side effects, um, it, it humanizes what they're doing. It humanizes the drug use and takes away some of that stigma, um, especially if you know what the drug they're using is. Um, you can often broach the subject just by asking them if they're getting whatever the side effects of that drug use are, because that shows that you care about the negative stuff that they're experiencing um, and that you are kind of reaching out in, in an attempt to help. Um, she admits it, after asking to using IV heroin daily for about the last two years since you last saw her. Um, and for the last eight to nine months, um, she's been using IV cocaine. Um, so there's a comment that sometimes mosquito bites will look like the one that you just showed. Um, how will we know for sure? It can be very deceiving to the client if we are accusing them. Um, that's a good point. And so that's why it's always important to, when you bring it up, um, not to be accusatory um, unless you know. So like I was saying, that second one, I have the benefit of, of uh, the environment in which I see patients. And so it may not work quite as well for you guys to directly approach them and say, hey, how long have you been using drugs? Um, there are certain patterns that are seen with, with uh, track marks that don't show up with mosquito bites. Um, so this last one, sure, is a little more scattered. And so I guess that could be mosquito bites. Um, something like this one on the right in particular, um, where it's all clustered right around a dark vein. Um, it's all bruised up. There's no way that's mosquito bites. Um, and especially with some of these um, on, on this side with uh, the different stages of healing all clustered right around the, the, the inside of the elbow with nothing elsewhere in the arm. Um, that's pretty classic for track marks and mosquito bites don't tend to show up just in, in the spot where the veins are. And you can also just, Maybe ask the question, can you tell me more about the marks on your hand, on your arms? 
instead of uh, using the word, uh, you know, um, what is it? You had needle, the needle marks. Track marks, yeah. The track marks. Um, and if they tell you that, you know, if their arm looks exactly like this and you ask them, you know, what's going on there, what's this about? Mm -hmm. If their response is, oh, it's mosquito bites and they want to brush past it, mm -hmm. they're not going to be ready to talk to you about it anyways. Mm -hmm. um, and so taking a kind of more oblique approach of, uh, here's some information about drug use um, in a less accusing manner um, would probably work better for that for that client anyways. Um, so this particular patient's never been in treatment before. Um, pregnancy was not planned, but it is desired. And the father of the baby is a boyfriend that she's been with for a couple of years who also uses heroin and cocaine. So this again brings up the other person in the house who's using. Um, What approaches, has, I guess first off, is this a scenario that, that any of you have found yourselves in? These are patients that I kind of came with off the top of my head as examples of how to apply some of the concepts from the paper. Um, you know, is, is this a scenario that you guys have found yourselves in before? I would ask if her partner, okay. So tomorrow said that, yes, a lot of, uh, a lot of my father of babies are drug users. Um, people aren't always honest about their own use. That is very, very true. Um, and ask if her partner and her are ready to get treatment. Yeah, so exactly right. Treating, you know, interacting with both people is, is going to be the key for this because especially if, even if they don't live together, if they are around one another constantly, this is an active relationship right now. Even if the patient is a 10 out of 10 on the readiness ruler, she wants to quit. She's actually already made her intake phone call to a treatment center and there's nothing more for you to do with her. Um, her likelihood of being successful in her recovery is very, very low if her significant other is still actively using. Um, and so trying to engage that person as well um, will provide her the greatest amount of benefit. In terms of applying the, uh, the paper to the situation, the motivational interviewing um, to help you kind of gather more information about her as well as provide her with information um, will help determine her thoughts on her drug use and trying to quit. Um, but then now that she's admitted to what she's using, you can go back into the paper in between your visits and just look up heroin and cocaine, find out the effects of it, find out how they're, um, how they're used, how they're uh, affecting the baby. In terms of looking them up, uh, there's a couple of references that I wanted to tell you guys about that I forgot to include in the PowerPoint. There are a couple of websites that I actually stumbled on when I was in college that helped get me interested in the, the subject of drug abuse in the first place. And I can include these with the um, information that's, that's sent out afterwards. Um, the first website is called Arrowid, E-R-O-W-I-D. If you Google that, you'll get to the website. It's just arrowid.org. Are you able to type it into the Oh, yeah, I can type it into the chat uh, as well. Um, no, except I can't type apparently. There we go. That second one I sent. Um, Arrowid is a very basic formatted website, but it's old. It's about two, three decades old. Um, that has uh, maybe not three. I don't know. That's pushing, the age, that's pushing the age of the internet. Um, so two decades, about two decades old. It's been around um, since before I was in college, and it is basically a uh, forum that people use to post their experiences with different kinds of drugs. And if you're curious about what the subjective effects are like of taking a drug, if you're curious about how a drug is used, what's some of the terminology that's used, Airwood's a great resource to just click around. Um, as I mentioned earlier, not, not everybody who uses drugs is burnt out and kind of lifeless and li lift, or rather listing through life. Um, a lot of them are very motivated and curious and interested in, in their use and will document full essays about 
the subjective effects and their experience and they'll compare it to other stuff. And so there's a lot of fascinating uh, information on Arrowhead about different types of drug use. Um, and there's another website um, called bluelight.org. I'll send that one. Um, that also talks about just different types. It's a similar similar type of thing. Um, blue light's a little bit more modern and they include a lot of uh, synthetic, a lot of the new synthetic drugs that are on the streets, um, discussing those. Um, don't share these websites with patients. I would recommend. Yep. They may already know about them, but <laughs> don't share it with clients because you don't want to help them with their substance use. Um, but they can be very fascinating if you've got an evening to kill on your board. Um, and so going back to the, the paper, you know, looking it up, you can see in our table of contents, these sections on the drugs of abuse and the effects of drug use during pregnancy would be the first places to go once you know what the client's taking. Um, and reading through those sections, the section of drugs of abuse will tell you the basics about that drug, um, what it does to the body and the uh, typical effects and side effects on anybody who's using. The effects of drug use during pregnancy is more pregnancy specific and how those drugs affect specifically a pregnant woman, uh, the fetus, and uh, the eventual newborn. Um, for both opioids and stimulants, the biggest effect um, is restricted fetal growth and uh, risk for spontaneous miscarriage or abortion. Um, as well as uh, withdrawal once the, once the child's born, um, just different types of withdrawal. And so once you've learned about it, the next time you meet with uh, this young lady, the primary goal of everything you're gonna be doing is just to give her the information. Um, she may not realize quite how dangerous the drugs she's using are, um, and teaching her the information gives her the resources she needs to try to help make an informed decision. Um, especially for people who are going to be continuing to um, follow through with patients. Um, of the different screening tools, I have to recommend the NIDA quick screen um, as something that can be used over and over with patients or with clients um, because it gives you kind of a quantitative, it gives you a number um, associated with uh, their drug use, which you can then track over time to see if they're um, successful in their attempts to cut back. And so I wanted to go through the NIDA quick screen um, with you guys for this client. Um, so the comment I put on the bottom here was that um, whenever you're in doubt, whenever you feel uncomfortable at any point with trying to provide some basic interventions for somebody, um, if you're ever in doubt, refer them to formal treatment, refer them to their primary care doctor at the very least in particular with alcohol, opioids, and sedatives. Um, alcohol and sedatives in particular, if people are trying to quit on their own, um, that withdrawal um, can be life-threatening. Um, opioid withdrawal for an individual isn't typically life-threatening, but during pregnancy can cause some pretty serious consequences to the, to the developing fetus. And so generally for these three things, um, if the clients you're working with are getting withdrawal symptoms when they're trying to quit, um, urge them to, to seek more formalized care um, because stopping on their own may end up causing some pretty serious effects for themselves and for their baby. So going through the NIDA, uh, NIDA is the National Institutes on uh, Drug Abuse. Um, going through their screen, the first question is basically, at any point in time, have you ever used uh, any of these things? Um, we've got a question, are newborns automatically drug tested at birth? Um, that's really dependent on where you are. Um, I'm trying to think. In Rochester, I think some of our hospitals will routinely screen um, either mother or baby, sometimes both, for drug use. Um, I feel like I'd be overstepping by saying it always happens, because I don't think it always happens, but I'm not quite sure what the OBGYNs use as their trigger to decide whether to screen or not. Um, and it's quite often not the baby itself that gets tested, but it's often uh, meconium testing or maternal testing. Um, there's a lot of uh, controversy about that 
peripartum testing. Um, not as much in New York State because it's not technically illegal for a pregnant mom to use drugs any more so than it would be for anybody to use drugs. There are some states where um, using drugs during pregnancy um, and getting caught will lead to you losing your uh, maternal rights and having your child taken away from you. Um, and so we didn't, I didn't get into that as much because it's not as much of an issue in New York State. Um, in New York, people can still lose their parental rights uh, due to drug use during pregnancy, but it's not an automatic thing. It's not strictly because of the drug use during pregnancy. It, 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 that can be a factor if uh, CPS gets involved and they want to file to um, remove the child from somebody's custody. Um, but there are some states where if you are arrested um, using drugs and pregnant, you will pretty much automatically lose your parental rights. Um, and so that's a, it's a topic that is very controversial right now. Um, so going through the uh, first question uh, with this young lady, she admits to occasionally smoking mar uh, marijuana. She admitted cocaine use, denied any prescription stimulants, methamphetamine, inhalants. Um, when you ask about sedatives or sleeping pills, she says she occasionally takes a Xanax when she gets really, really anxious, um, but that it's not hers. She gets them from a friend. Um, she's never used any hallucinogens, admits uh, as she previously had to the heroin, and she says that when she has trouble getting heroin, occasionally she'll take um, some Oxycontin um, or some hydrocodone, and then she denies any other drugs. And so this is your starting point for going through the uh, NIDA screen. Um, from that point, you get into a little bit more uh, details with all of these. And all of these scores are going to be tallied up at the end based on individual subscores for each category of drug use in the screen. Um, if they've never screened positive, you can kind of pre-circle the zeros, or not screen, but if they say that they've never used a category of drugs, you can just circle zero for all of those. But for the um, five things that she said yes to, you get an idea of how frequently they're using it. Cannabis, she, a couple times a month. Uh, cocaine and heroin, she said she's using daily. Maybe once a week, she uses some uh, prescription opioids and just once or twice um, has used the, the sleeping pills as Xanax. Um, the next question is about how often they get desires to use uh, or urges to use drugs. Um, this comes down to um, some of that more addictive behavior and not just the, the, the physical dependence or the physical use, but is your mind urging you? Are you uh, developing cravings and are you starting to get some of those behavioral um, aspects of addiction? The fourth question is how often has your use of the drug uh, led to health, social, legal, or financial problems? Um, this is often a, an eye-opening question for a lot of patients because they don't always necessarily think about it, but then when you bring it up to them and they're forced to kind of pick a, a scale for it, they're often able to realize, yeah, you know, it's causing a lot of financial problems for me to um, pay for all these drugs. In particular, the, the opioids and the cocaine, she's realized, especially these health consequences, um, her IV heroin use has led her getting these skin infections. Um, and this isn't the first time she's had them. And so she's at least able to start recognizing that she's getting lots of consequences from her drug use. Um, how often have you failed to do what was normally expected of you because of your drug use? Um, this is also another one that kind of starts to drive home in their minds the um, negative consequences that have happened because of their drug use. Oftentimes, if they don't have a job and you ask them why, why aren't you working? You know what happened? It's often because they weren't able, they were showing up to late work. They weren't able. To, sorry, <laughs> they were showing up to work late. They um, weren't able to meet the expectations of their job, um, and that often gets traced back to the drug use. Has a friend or relative or anyone else ever expressed concern about your drug use um, or about your use of that specific drug? Um, quite often this, at least in my experiences, doesn't get as much insight generated in patients because if it has come up, um, most people have a pretty good way of brushing aside those concerns and saying, oh, well, they're making it out to be more than it is. They're overblowing. Um, 
have you ever tried and failed to control or cut down uh, on your use of certain drugs? Um, I think this is an important distinction um, because oftentimes, especially if they are getting those negative consequences, they've already tried on their own to cut back and they're not always able to. Um, and so this is not just have you tried, but have you f tried and failed? Because um, that helps to drive home in their heads that I don't have the control over this that I thought I did. Um, oftentimes people who are using drugs, uh, their response to any sort of criticism about it would be, yeah, but I've got it under control. You know, I can control how much I'm using and pointing out to them that, yeah, no, you tried and you couldn't, you don't have as much control over it um, can be an important distinction. And then the last question is if they're using IV drugs um, to just uh, recommend that they get hepatitis B and C and HIV testing. Um, even if they tell you that, no, I've never shared needles and I've always been really careful, still get them tested um, because oftentimes they may not share their needle with their first hit, but once they're high, they may then start sharing that needle with anybody else that's around and they may not remember it. Um, I've had plenty of patients who have adamantly, adamantly denied sharing needles ever, uh, who ended up testing positive and couldn't remember how or when they um, may have contracted uh, hepatitis. And so going through, um, going through all of those, um, as you kind of suspected, uh, looking at it, the cannabis and uh, sedatives, um, she's not at quite as high a risk uh, related to, you know, she didn't have cravings for those. It was only a little bit of use. Um, they hadn't really led to major impacts on her life. And so those ended up being yellow with the moderate risk. Um, the window of moderate risk is quite large. Um, but the, her cocaine, um, heroin and prescription opioid use is, is definitely in the high risk category. Um, in general, if somebody is using IV drugs, they will almost uniformly fall into a high risk category for whatever drug that is. Um, I've only seen one or two people um, who were using IV drugs, but somehow managed to not fall into the high risk category. Um, and I, one of them, it was because they had literally just started using IV drugs about a week beforehand. And so they hadn't been using long enough to get all the consequences. Um, and the other one had been using IV drugs for so long that he didn't really see the consequences as consequences because that had just become part of his life. And so this is just kind of summarizing everything from the prior slide. Um, people who are high risk um, for their drug use typically require referral to a specialized treatment center. You can start doing some basic uh, brief intervention and motivational interviewing with them, um, but the likelihood of them being able to cut back or stop without formalized treatment is pretty low. Um, for people who are in the moderate risk categories, um, that's really who the brief interventions are, are geared towards. Um, and quite often, especially during pregnancy, women are able to um, curtail their use. Um, it's actually very, very common for women during the second and third trimester, particularly the third trimester of pregnancy, to, to be able to completely curtail drug and alcohol use um, without formal interventions of any sort. Um, but then almost all the time, those patients will end up relapsing after birth. And as I mentioned, the quick and dirty is that if they're using IV drugs, they're probably gonna be high risk. Um, you don't necessarily have to go through the full screen with them. Um, and if at any point while they're trying to cut back, they start developing withdrawal, um, remind them that they, they should then either stop trying to cut back for the time being, um, but that they should definitely try to engage with local detox um, or rehab uh, because they'll probably need some medication uh, assistance in trying to uh, get off of drugs. With regards to the uh, referral to treatment, um, as I mentioned, it's a lot less data driven than the first two parts of SBIRT, and there's a ton of regional variation, um, even within New York State. Uh, for depending on where exactly in the state you are, if you go to oasas.org, um, actually, sorry, oasas.ny.gov, um, that is the Office of Alcohol and Substance Abuse Services for the state of New York. Um, they've got a lot of information up on there. They've got a okay uh, bed finder. I'm not gonna say it's great because it can be a little bit clunky to use, but you can search for um, treatment centers based on zip code. And so you can find all the um, 
local treatment centers in your area and it'll give you some basics about what services they offer. Um, oftentimes, knowing where to refer somebody is gonna come down to your own personal level of comfort, both with, with the person and with uh, the knowledge of different centers. Um, in some places, referral can be legally mandated. Um, I know that happens in New York State as well. There's a lot of uh, folks who end up involved with the legal system who end up in either, it's either pretrial diversion, where um, the court strongly urges people to engage in substance abuse treatment. And if they do so, they're often able to avoid actually being charged with whatever the issue was. Um, and there's also drug court. Um, in Rochester, our drug court is one of the, uh, I think it's actually the oldest in the country. Um, it's a fantastic, fantastic system that has helped uh, thousands of people uh, step away from, from, from drugs. Sometimes having that, that stick uh, to urge people into treatment is very helpful. Um, this is another website in our area, the uh, National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence. Um, <coughs> similarly to the OASIS website, we have a lot of resources on there. Um, in particular, there is one if on this website, if you click under the news and resources, the first link that pops up, if you're in the Rochester area, um, and want to get somebody connected to treatment, there's a PDF of all the treatment centers in our area, um, <coughs> under that news and resources tab. Um, it's actually what I hand out to people in the emergency department when they're interested. Um, and it has all the contact information and a checklist of the services available at each place. This is the homepage for oasis.ny.gov. And up in the right-hand corner on the page, you see the bed availability dashboard. Click on that and it'll give you a place to put in your zip code. Um, and then another um, national treatment uh, information can be found on SAMHSA's website. It's a Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Um, I'm not quite as familiar with their website since I mainly operate in the state of New York. Are there any questions? Any other thoughts from people? Any other clinical scenarios that have been bugging you lately that perhaps we can discuss? All right. Um, if not, if there's any, oh, oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you for saying thank you. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, when we have webinars, it's di difficult to see gauge from the audience whether this is useful or or not. And uh, so, appreciate the comments. Absolutely. Um, are there, you know, in the five minutes we have left here, uh, any? maybe particular scenarios you've come across, any particular types of clients, you know, women that you've talked to that um, maybe was difficult for you in addressing, you know, how, kind of helping her that you want to take a stab and share with us and maybe we can provide some guidance or some help or... And so while you think about that, uh, any scenarios specifically, um, is there, in terms of the use of the expert or any of like the NIDA or any other um, tools, are, maybe we should have had a poll on this, like how many of you are using um, it, any of the other screening tools? So I know the first poll was on the expert, um, and is there anyone that is not using any screening tools? that maybe you're thinking we may we want you're thinking of maybe we should talk to the supervisor or the program and, and start implementing or any questions about the tools before i forget i did want to send uh give everybody my email address if you have any questions about the um, about the paper about mm -hmm. any of the stuff that we've right. talked about today um i'm not always able to respond right away because sometimes i'm tied up in the ed um but i'm always happy to, to help out whenever i can mm -hmm. 
Um, Sue's mentioned that she has a client who's not pregnant, but due to her job, she has to drink alcohol almost every day. Um, the only thing I do, I'm assuming she's a bartender. Um, the has to is probably pushing it, but um, I'm trying to think about what else she would be doing where she would have to drink every day. Could, could uh, maybe expand more as to why she feels has to drink alcohol? What is she saying that it's, it's uh, requiring for her to drink? And does she, does she see a problem with that? <laughs> Hmm. So, I mean, in terms of drinking every day, um, then there comes the question of what's the pattern if it's around the clock through the course of the day, um, if she's meeting any other criteria for alcohol dependence, if she starts getting withdrawal symptoms, um, does she find that she has cravings to drink? Um, it is very possible to have physical dependence without a lot of the other behavioral things that happen with, with true addiction. Um, even if she, especially if she's feeling compelled to drink, like she feels like she has to for the job, um, she may very well be becoming physically dependent on it, but if she's not waking up and feeling like she wants to go drink or she's getting shakes, uh, works at a bar and the way she gets paid is due to the amount of money the client spends on her. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's, I, and I've talked to um, actually friends when I was in college who were bartenders who, who echoed a similar thing, who felt like they had to while they were at work because people would buy them shots. And if you don't, they're going to think you're slighting them. Um, so that's really difficult. Um, it's part of her making money. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, it, I guess, would have to come down to seeing if she's able to figure out a way that she can politely tell people. Um, that she's not drinking or come up with excuses not to. Um, maybe thanking them very much for the drink, um, but asking them if they want it instead or if they want to give it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, but that's tough. That's a very difficult scenario. Taking a non computerized NIDA. Oh, that's a great excuse, company policy. The problem with that is that if there's anybody else um, uh -huh. there that is, um, or if they've seen, if it's like repeat customers who, who, have, who know that she, mm -hmm. that she drinks while at work. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. Part of, it is part of the policy. It's part of the policy that they have to, that they have to drink. Man, that sounds like a uh, bad company to work for. I am sorry. fired that man while working. So it may just depend on the location that you're working. As yeah. to what their requirements are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Tickets for the drinks. Okay. Um, in terms of the non computerized NIDA, um, the, I'm trying to see, there's, I know that the website, give me a second, I can find the website that has the um, NIDA screen on it. Um, and I think actually at the end of the paper that we're gonna be sending out, um, there's a, a paper copy of it that you can photocopy um, to use. Mm -hmm. NIDA, quick screen, find it real quick. Um, if you sure, and Sam, Carol, um, hmm. so why Dr. Fields is in search of that in the um, to address the question? Well, he does that in the uh, report. Um, there are appendices that where the NIDA is also, the screen is, is included in there. So if you wanted to print that out, uh, you could, um, <clears throat> unless we find it here on the website where you can actually get the form downloaded. Um, um, I know it's 1130. 
And if he finds it, we'll send it in an email. If, okay. I don't want to hold people, oh, but there is. If you if you just Google search NIDA Quick Screen, the second link down is a PDF. Um, okay. It says step one, but it has. Well, you know what? It's got all of the questions. It doesn't have the same fully expanded um, that I use to catch the screenshots for the presentation, um, but it's got all eight questions, um, but it only has each of the questions two through eight are each just on one line. And so you'd have to do a copy of it for each substance use, but it at least has a version of it um, that can be used. So thank you everyone for your time and thank you Dr. Fields for uh, sharing, being here with us and sharing some of the tips uh, in the field. Um, so we wish you the best. I think that one of the things that I would strongly recommend is getting really comfortable with the categories and what they do. Um, and then next, getting comfortable asking the questions. Um, and you know, if you have uh, your specific program, have a screening tool where you ask these different questions, getting comfortable asking those questions too. And, and again, I would encourage you to practice asking the questions with a colleague. How would you, you know, ask her if, if, if she's using this particular drug, how would you present the information? Um, that way you're not perceived as judgmental or you're not, your statements are not judgmental because <laughs> um, you don't want to do that either, right? Um, you want to uh, make the client as comfortable as possible and gain her trust and build a report with her so that uh, she's able to um, talk with you about it, honestly. So thank you, everyone. Have a good day. And uh, we will send you these additional resources and the copy of the slides uh, later this afternoon. Um, so again, thank you. And I'm glad that you know, many of you enjoyed it and participated as well. And we appreciate hearing your field um, experiences and questions. Um, so have a good day and afternoon. <laughs>